Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm your host, the forum's creator, and your chief cat herder for the next hour of conversation. I'm really excited by this week's guest. We have a terrific top to our discussion. Ever since very early 2020, we've been exploring every month, in fact, every other week at times, what the pandemic has meant for higher education, what we've learned, how higher education has responded, and where we're headed. Now, this week's guest is very interested in questions of disability and what the COVID-19 experience has taught us about that. Lee scouter Pissette is an absolute pleasure to host. She's a colleague of mine at Georgetown University, where she's a director for assistant director for digital learning. Uh, she is someone who is a fantastic WordPress ninja who has been using WordPress and teaching about it for a long time. In fact, this past semester, I've had the pleasure of having her in one of my classes teaching students how to use WordPress. She is a great writer with a long background, a terrific thinker, and for my money, one of our best guests. So today we're going to start off by talking about what the pandemic has taught us and how we can redesign higher education for the future. So without any further ado, let me bring to the stage Lee scalera Bissett. Hello, Lee. Hey, Brian. How are you? Great. How are you doing this afternoon? I'm doing really well, actually. Um, you know, That's it's nice. a nice, quiet, uh, penultimate uh, day of final exams at Georgetown. So um, fingers crossed, everything keeps running smoothly. Uh, we just we just pivoted to give people the option of changing their exams at the last minute to remote because of our uh, spike in COVID-19. So um, we, we're we're sort of on call right now for faculty asking us at the very last minute how they could do that. So oh, wow. uh, as 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 you do in these particular times, of course. Oh, that's yes. Yeah. Uh, I introduced you by just frantically gesturing at the many things you've done in the past. But as you know, on the forum, we'd like to have people introduce themselves by talking about what they'll be doing in the next year. So, Lee, what, what are the big topics, the big projects that are top of mind for you as you look ahead to 2022? Um, so this is going to be an opportunity to plug my book that's about to come out. Yes. Uh, yeah, so um, actually, uh, I edited a book with Kansas. Uh, I always forget. It's the University of Press of Kansas, right? Um, anyways, called uh, Affective Labor and uh, Alt Act mm. Careers. Mm. And it's an edited collection of um, people working in various staff roles from across higher education coming together to um, write about and talk about affective and emotional labor in our work. And we're really, really excited. It's the first collection of its kind. It's cross, I don't want to say it's cross disciplinary, but it's cross uh, because it is that as well. But it's very much across um, departments and across silos. So we have people from student services, people from libraries, people from faculty development, people from IT, um, people from, you know, from across the institution, again, as I said, in various staff roles, um, talking about emotional labor. Uh, uh -huh. We're also going to have a um, companion podcast, because of course we are, uh, to go with it uh, as as timing goes, the the book, the, the manuscript was completed and put to the press literally a month before everything shut down in 2020. So um, we want I wanted to give the authors and, uh, and the contributors an opportunity to you know revisit what they said in their contribution and to think about it, um, it through the lens of COVID-19 as well and how that may or may not have impacted, amplified, changed what it is that they said in their essay that they had written in uh, the before time, so to speak. So look for that. Um, really, really excited. The, the, the authors and the contributors were all amazing. The book is amazing. And um, I can't wait for it to come out. So it should it, it is should be out. Everything is going according to schedule. Um, it should be out in March. So that's the big thing that I'm, I, I guess I'm not working on it anymore, but it is the thing that I'm gearing up and thinking about how to, um, how to promote, how to talk about, and just try to get the word out to people um, about it for March. So you will be working on it. Yeah, I guess that's right. <laughs> I have podcast episodes to edit. So there's that. Um, <laughs> books are like, books are like children. Uh, it yeah. never ends. It never no. ends. 
No, and I'm I'm looking forward to finding that one typo as soon as I get the published copy. Uh, <laughs> so with that, that no one caught. <laughs> what else are you going to be doing on uh, on Georgetown's campus? Uh, are you going to be uh, teaching more domain of one's own classes, or can I talk yep. you to doing more WordPress classes with me? Or? Sure, that was actually really a lot of fun because so what what Brian didn't say is that he was teaching an uh, um, a course on the history of technology. And so it wasn't, I had the opportunity because usually I go in and I just teach, here's how you use WordPress, you know, taxonomies, categories versus tags, posts versus pages, themes, you know, the, the general thing. And I always do a, a brief overview and a really brief history of WordPress that it's open source, it's longstanding, what does that mean? But the students actually don't usually care about that. They're just like, show me how to use WordPress, right? I don't really, it doesn't really matter to me all that much. They get interested when I say that um, WordPress is the back end of um, of a lot of the internet. That gets them interested because then it's a transferable skill. But in Brian's class, what was great is that we actually dove into the history of WordPress and really did a critical examination through looking at various iterations of WordPress, the various annual themes, the various backend interfaces like the block editor, uh, Brian's favorite thing in the world, um, and what that says about the evolution of WordPress as a technology. And um, it was just a really great opportunity to, to look critically um, at WordPress, at the history of WordPress, and what the evolution of WordPress teaches us about the evolution of technology, the evolution of interface, the evolution of the web, all of these kinds of things. And it was really great because, you know, uh, some of the students are young, and so it's like WordPress is, you know, only slightly younger than they are. Uh, so, the, you know, never knew a world without WordPress kind of thing. Um, and uh, so that was a lot of fun. But I should be, um, I, I also do, in the Learning Design and Technology program, I do a course on, um, a design studio actually, on uh, e-portfolios and digital identity. So I work with uh, uh, the LDT students on developing not just their e-portfolio, but thinking holistically about digital identity, building their digital identity, and um, really being able to get into that metacognitive work of connecting um, the work that they do in the LDT program with uh -huh. the work that they want to eventually do, the work that they've done before, and who they are. So, and, and with some WordPress sprinkled in there because that's the platform we don't require, but we encourage them to use for it. So it's a lot of fun. I saw the question. There we go. It's University Press of Canvas. Thank you, Mark. Well, the, the, the forum community is incredibly brilliant and really, really fast to the URL. Um, and I have a pre-order link, which I didn't even know I had. Thank you. That was a good friend. Um, but <laughs> listen, everybody, what, what Lee just described, I want to make sure that you hear the, the cognitive leaps she made with a great deal of elegance and speed, which was to move from the uh, details of manually using software uh, to the larger conceptual issues around them, everything from design to the human components. Uh, this is one of the reasons we love Lee is because she was able to do that kind of work just, just effortlessly. Um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that, Lee, and uh, I've got all kinds of ideas. Yeah. Um, and uh, thanks, everybody, for, uh, uh, for quickly doing the bibliographic work. Uh, John Hollenbeck yeah. had a quick question for you, actually, which may start mm -hmm. us off. He asks, do you find today's students less technically adept when facing code? I think it's just differently technically adept. Go on. Right? So, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a classic Gen X where, you know, I... I sort of every single new technology was always new and kind of introduced at just that right phase in my life where I was just like, huh, this is a thing. But, you know, I also had a dad who, um, you know, we had a VIC-20 going up, growing up and we had a Commodore 64 growing up. Yes, there we go. Right. And my dad had a, um, you know, my dad got a compact Presario and was very early on the web and was really into BBSs. Right. Like he was like, they're Monty Python PBSs, you know. So, again, I come by my nerddom rightfully. Um, and then, you know, I started an undergraduate program in the mid 90s and had a, you know, forward looking professor, uh, adjunct professor, because we were taking a desktop publishing course. So this is what? the sort of 
yeah. you know, this is when I was doing it. We were doing desktop publishing. We needed a 15 week course on desktop publishing to learn frame maker. And what, what our, what our professor said, he's like, look, the interfaces, and again, this is why I'm interested also in the history of interfaces and how things have changed is, you know, he said the interface for our frame maker is getting increasingly like what you see is what you get. And so we don't need to spend 15 weeks on this. So I'll spend seven weeks on this, show you the basics, but then you really all want to get jobs moving forward. You need to learn how to code in HTML. And we were like, okay. And so then we spend the second half of the course learning how to co hand code in HTML. We learned about the one by one clear GIF, which I saw through my timeline. Somebody had written it recently has written a history of, which I'm so excited because no one ever believes me now when I tell them about it. Um, and so I had a certain technical adept. You know, I was technically adept at, at these things. I, I, I wrote on the web. I, I kind of embraced Twitter. Um, and then in my previous job, though, at the University of Mary Washington, I taught an intro to digital studies course. And yeah. when I was teaching that course, that was when Snapchat was like all the mm -hmm. rage. And it didn't matter how many times I taught the course and how many times the students tried to explain to me why they loved Snapchat. I never got Snapchat. I was just like, why not Instagram? Yeah. Um, and, and so again, and I see my own kids, I have a, an, an almost 13 and an almost 15 year old. And, you know, while they may be challenged on something like, they know Discord, like the back of their hands, like Discord, they all love it. They've all embraced it. They have Discord servers. Uh, you know, my daughter's on like, uh, is an admin on like five different Minecraft servers. You know, my son um, plays this game called Geometry Dash. But the cool thing about Geometry Dash is that they've made it basically open source um, so that participant players can create their own Geometry Dash levels that then they can share with their friends or submit for approval, then they get integrated into the game. Um, you know, so they're, they're technically adept at a lot of things that I, ooh, I don't know. Like I know Discord, but I'm not nearly as good as my daughter is. Is like she's on like 27 Discord servers. Um, but if I ask them to attach something to an email, yeah, no, they probably don't know how to do that. But again, it's this differing expectations about they they do have te technical skills. They just we all have different technical skills based on what it is we we use every day and what it is we've kind of grown up using or or embraced right. using. Yes. in that sort of thing. So I, I think that it's it's very much, and, and again, my kids are also really privileged, right? We live in Northern Virginia. We are, I, you know, I work at Georgetown. My husband works in DC. We're doing okay. Um, and that's the other thing that I learned when I, one of my other previous jobs, I have lots of previous jobs. When I was working at a place like Moorhead State University, huh? um, where there's, you know, very little broadband, um, you know, very little high speed, uh, not wide access to computers. Well, they have a very different technical knowledge, Yeah. right? They have much more of a mechanical knowledge. They know how to do things on mobile phones in ways that I, you know, that I haven't embraced. So again, it's, it's very dependent on the population that you're talking about um, in terms of privilege, in terms of race. Um, and just in terms of also, I don't want to say generational, but you know, I, that matters. Right, that thing that you embrace, think of it as like all of our favorite TV shows, right? That the next generation just doesn't get. It's a different, a different situation completely. Uh, we we yeah. had the the chat box is going crazy with nostalgia. Yeah. Um, and, uh, <laughs> Glad John, it could help. <laughs> John Holbeck may have defeated us all by talking about working on a Sinclair, which is just great. Um, the, uh, but one quick question came in from uh, Steve Ehrman, who asks, your session about WordPress in context, is or will there be a way for us to learn from you, either a recording of that session or a forthcoming paper? <laughs> you make it sound like I'm going to write the thing. Um, so, um, so, well, in Brian's class, what we've ended up doing is it was actually a conversation that took place over six different classes. Yeah. Was it? Yeah. And so it, it, it was really experimental in that sense where, or experiential, should I say, because we talked about WordPress and then we got them into the Commons blog, which has the old WordPress interface um, and had them in that. And then we talked a little bit about what that meant and then, you know, brought them back and said, okay, now set up your domain and, and install Gutenberg and then had them, you know, experience that and see what happened. So it was more of a, it was more of a progress. 
uh, going through it. So I never thought to, you know, write it down. I guess I could do a blog post, right? You can do things like that. You can write blog posts. Can I do that? Sure. Uh, <laughs> I think Steve wanted to ask you a bit about that. Uh, Steve? Yeah. Yeah. Um, in uh, one of the things that fascinated me years ago about writing across the curriculum was that it was based on the assumption that many of the experiences students have in college either contribute to the improvement of or the atrophy of their ability to communicate. Uh, one thing that's uh, troubled me about the way that colleges typically handle the development of students' capabilities of using digital tools and resources is that it's often uh, completely separate from the liberal education of those students and the professional education of those students. So for example, the way that students learn about um, uh, the creation of multimedia and video editing um, has nothing to do with developing their visual literacy. Uh, conceptually, it seems to me that that institutions ought to much, much more often be doing the kind of thing that you did with Brian. I thought it was a really stimulating example of is there is there do you, can you think of ways in which this sort of thing could become more institutionalized? Um, no, I'll just leave it at that. That's a great yeah. question. Yeah, it is. And so I think that I, I totally agree. Coming from sort of a, a, a teaching writing and my experience at University of Mary Washington with digital studies, I think they're a really interesting example because they have integrated digital fluency as one of their core learning outcomes for the students. Mm -hmm. um, and this came in the new strategic plan that they um, did well, I don't, time has no meaning. I don't know, before the, before, in the before times. And um, what ended up happening was in the new strategic plan, um, the way Mary Washington has their kind of gen ed set up is that they don't have freshman writing or freshman speaking courses, but what they had were writing intensive and speaking intensive courses. And so when they did their re gen ed revamp, that's what they decided. And we had capacity for digital studies at, um, University of Mary Washington with first a minor and then a full major in digital studies and communications, but also a long history with um, uh, UMW blogs, one of the first WordPress multi-sites for educational purposes, as well as then domain of one's own, um, the digital uh, digital history component at, the, at um, in their history department. And so what they did is a strategic plan is they wanted to be leaders in uh, the digital liberal arts. And so in the strategic plan that they said that they would embrace digital fluency. Now we can debate about digital fluency and what that means. <laughs> That's a whole other session. Um, but what ended up happening is that there was enough capacity that they added a, ge a gen ed requirement that students will have to complete a certain number of digitally intensive courses in the same way that they have to do speaking intensive and writing intensive for that very reason. They didn't want speaking and writing to be divorced from the disciplines that they were in, right? Um, so you can apply, they have criteria and all of that, and there's a committee, and you can apply to be a, uh, a speaking intensive or writing intensive and now a digitally intensive course with the expectations that if the students take these, that they're going to come out with a certain number of not only disciplinary skills, but also digital skills. And so it's a really great model um, for thinking more um, integratively about exactly what you're saying. And, you know, it's happening a lot with the, the domain of one's own schools. Georgetown is the domain of, the domain of one's own school. Um, there are, they're, they're, they're popping up everywhere annually. Um, and all of them have had various ways that they have used WordPress, that they've not just WordPress, but they've used domain of one's own to try and integrate these digital skills on a disciplinary level so that you're not just learning how to use WordPress, but you're learning how to use WordPress in the context of your digital history course or your uh, rhetoric and composition course or, you know, whatever it is that you happen to be doing, even your biology course. Mm -hmm. right? So, um, the domain of one's own schools are doing really great work for that. So, and and in, in other ways too. So I'm thinking of um, uh, Martha Burtis, one of the original founders is now with Robin DeRose up at Plymouth State. 
and they are at the forefront of using something the domain of one's own for OER. Um, so allowing students to think about accessibility, to think about affordability, uh, and to to make those um, and to make those available, uh, but also to co-create them with their students. Yeah, I think it would be great too if, as institutions scale up the use of high impact practices like undergraduate research and service learning, and oh yeah, capstone courses, that that the the digital uh, media become part of that too. Um, yeah. Not least because we know that those kinds of practices um, uh, benefit all students, but especially students from underserved groups. Yeah. So you, you really can make it much more integral to the development of the student. I think it's very exciting stuff. I'd like to follow up with you later on. Yeah, sure. Go right ahead. Um, I'm glad you two can connect. Um, and especially since you've both been guests on this program, and <laughs> and Lee, you might remember that we uh, we used Steve's uh, uh, recent book uh, in our summer foundations. Class. Of course, yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, you're both awesome. Thank you, thank you, Steve, for the question. Thanks. Uh, that's good to see you. But that um, actually brings up a really interesting point about what um, we talked about talking about today, uh -huh. which is this idea of the impact that. COVID-19 has had on our institutions. Yes. And in this particular case, I am thinking, and I've worked at, this is the first time I will be completely transparent. Georgetown is the first time that I have worked at an elite private institution. Just about my entire career, I have worked at um, regional mm -hmm. comprehensive mm -hmm. public institutions. Um, I did work for at an R1 for a hot minute, but that was still a public R1 in the South. so an SEC mm -hmm. school, so take that with what you want. Mm -hmm. And so there's this there's this interesting experience that I've that I, you know I'm I'm having with this with this change, but then COVID-19 hits. And you know, there is this tension now, and, and I think a lot of us have experienced that where, you know, what does it mean to go remote? What does it mean to a quote unquote high touch? institution to go remote but as we go on right and so we've gone away because we were very we were very careful not to say it was online learning of course because you know don't want to be conflated with that for better or for worse it's a whole other thing um but now that we've gone back to in person largely in person and again um most of our undergraduates um at at georgetown um, there are uh, no online courses for undergraduate students during the traditional academic school year. We have on online classes for continuing education, professional education. We do some summer online courses, but the, you know, between August and, and May, right? September, August and May, it is the residential experience, right? The residential liberal arts experience, except not really not right now right, where we made the decision that large classes, because we couldn't ensure social distancing, would remain online, right, and there'd still be smaller seminars in person. But also, the other thing that happened this semester, and we've all experienced this regardless of institution type, is that students stopped coming to class when they were sick. And this meant that these classes that had been designed for primarily face-to-face -face instruction right, the back to normal that we were all hoping for, mm -hmm. um, didn't work anymore, right? And, and what was really interesting to me is that it really underlined this ableist assumption that mm -hmm. runs through our entire, the entire way we think of particularly elite higher education, but education generally, is that it is based on this unspoken and, and just accepted premise that 100% of our students are going to be there 100% of the time or close enough to it. Right? So this is this is how we've set up our semesters. This is how we've set up our institutions. This is how we set up our courses and our course design is that 100% of our students are going to be there 100% of the time. And you know, and, and we've all experienced it probably as students, in our own students, and even us as faculty or instructors, where there are days where we probably shouldn't have come to class, but we did 
because the most important thing was that we were present. Yeah. Like physically present. Yeah. Right. Because that is, you know, one of the keys. And again, I've worked at um, non elite institutions where it was drilled into our heads. The most important factor for students succeeding is that they come to class. So make sure your students come to class. Heavily penalize your students if they don't come to class because they have to come to class in order to be successful. And of course, we just sort of took that research. But is that so? Because we've set up a system that only allows for students to be successful if they're there 100% of the time? We never questioned that assumption. But now we are we are really being faced with the limitations of that assumption. And the disability community have been screaming this for years. I can't come to class. I can't make a class for physical reasons, for mental reasons, for all kinds of reasons. And there is zero flexibility, right? Because it's just that's not the way things are set up. Butts and seats. Um, yeah, butts hours. and seats. Contact hours, but yeah, and even accreditation, right? One of the pro one of the challenges of the remote going to remote instruction is that SACS lost its mind um, because what about the contact hours? Uh, I also worked at a lot of SAC schools. This is my first school in a long time. That's not a SAC school, so I have a little bit of uh, a, a little mm -hmm. bit of uh, leftover from that too. We, host, we hosted the uh, the the head of SACS here a few months ago. Um, <laughs> In the, in the chat, George Station, with his customary uh, penetration, points out that the link here is to the Carnegie unit and uh, the credit hour that Carnegie gave us. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of a lot of fun back and forth in the uh, in the chat about this, um, yeah. which is which is a lot of fun. But that's but what you're putting out is that while this may work for some portion of the population, this is a serious problem for those who have physical and or uh, mental disabilities. And uh, yeah, but do the pandemic? But it's going to be a. This is real. Did the yeah. pandemic crack that open? Yeah, and I think it's going to be a, a challenge moving forward for everyone, because you know, again, I'll I'll take George Shannon as the example because that's the example that I you know that I most recently experienced. But we didn't have any problem right up until right now with COVID, but we had a huge flu outbreak, and then we got the Rona virus, and everybody got this like the right. stomach bug, right. right, which we all thought was food poisoning at one point, and right. so. Uh, and usually when this happens, they sort of, the students dutifully drag themselves to class, right? Looking horrible because it's like, well, I'm here, right? Even if though, like, let's let's talk about presence is if you're a butt in a seat, but you're actually just trying not to throw up the entire time. Are you really there in class? But so you have this where students are going to stop coming to class when they're sick. And you know what? That's not a bad thing. But if students stop coming to class when they're sick, what does that do to our course design? Right? And we can say hybrid. Right. But again, right. what does that mean? Because typically when we think of hybrid, we think of something that's very scheduled. These three weeks are going to be um, asynchronous. These three weeks are going to be synchronous or we meet on Mondays. But, you know, disability doesn't care. Depression doesn't care. The flu doesn't care. Flu doesn't care that the rest of the week is asynchronous. If you're sick on Monday, you're sick on Monday, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is, and, and, and what was striking to me as well was not only on the student side, but on the faculty side, that the faculty who were the most flexible, who were the most understanding, who were the most, right, um, you know, uh, conscious and caring and empathetic. They were the ones who were struggling the most because they ran up against the limitations of the way the system was set up. They were juggling multiple deadlines. They were juggling, we don't know how many students are going to be in class from one day to the next. We don't yeah. know who's going to be remote. We don't know, you know, we don't know how we're going to run these exams, you know, because of all of these unknowns. And, and again, when when a student is sick and it can be exceptional right then it's okay i've got one student or maybe two students who are going to be handing something in late or two students who need to write the exam at a different time what if it's half the class what if it's the entire class and everybody's handing in their stuff on different dates you know and and so again this puts a lot of stress on faculty and their ability to be quote unquote flexible. I'm trying to get us to stop saying the word flexible because I'm like, those faculty who are being flexible are just done. 
Um, they've, they, you know, the, the, they've bent and now they've broken. And so I don't think we need to talk about flexibility anymore, but what, what are we going to talk about instead? And that's the heart of the question that I think we have to grapple with in higher education is it's not flexibility anymore. It's got to be a wholesale change. And what does that mean? Is this high flex that you're talking about? I mean, that's uh, uh, Beatty defines that as, uh, you know, the, the students and the faculty and any support staff for each given class session have a choice if they're going to be face to face or online. And I think high flex is a way to think about it. But here's the other Here's the other again that we were talking about the 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 square peg in the round hole no. is that when we're talking about particularly certain types of institutions, right, like Georgetown, right, um, like elite liberal arts colleges, like even um, you know the 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 gold what is it the golden dozen, you know all of these places, they have a very narrow definition of what a quality education is, right? High touch, right? That's where we use all the time, high touch. Yep. Well, what does high touch mean? How do you square the circle of high touch with um, high flex? Because for a lot of people, they are incompatible. And that's not what we're selling our students on. And that's not what we've sold our faculty on to get them to come to the institutions, right? And so while I've seen high flex, I've seen lots of it done again at institutions that serve various student populations where the demand was there for that kind of experience, either due to convenience, either due to um, student population, you know, whatever it is. Um, but that's not, you know, again, that's not what we do. It's not what we've done. Um, it's not how we've branded ourselves. Um, so then what does it mean mm. to mm. rethink what high touch means in this, I hate to use it, but for shorthand, in this new normal? What yeah. does high touch mean? This is a fantastic, uh, deep way of rethinking uh, classroom experience and class design. Uh, we, we have a, a bunch of questions that are that are coming in. Uh, I just want to quickly, a couple of them, uh, Neil Fung and others have asked about high flex. Um, the, uh, there's a great ebook on the subject, uh, free uh, mm -hmm. by Brian Beatty. We also have two forum sessions on the topic, uh, which you can, yeah. you can find for free. Uh, building on this, the excellent uh, Chris Mackey has a question. Um, and I think this gives us a way in, one way into it. Uh, Chris asks, what do we think we've learned that will help remote learners, especially at risk, create remote supportive learning spaces socially and emotionally? That's a really good question. Uh, I think the one thing that we've learned is that it's not easy um, and that it is in, it is resource heavy. Yes. In some ways, resource heavier than the in-person experience. Yes. Um, I think, and so, you know, it's, I'm, I'm staff. And I, you know, write about staff issues a lot, but this is this is where I think faculty have finally had their eyes open to the importance of staff in the student learning experience. A lot of these students would not have made it through if not for the support of student services staff, um, health staff, uh, residence life staff, um, because they all pivoted, right? Again, the word, word that we've all used so much, they all pivoted. Every single one of them in service of the students pivoted from we're not living together anymore, but we still have residence life. How are we going to do this? We uh -huh. still have student life. How are we going to do this? How are we going to build community? How are we going to do those things? How are we going to make sure that it's accessible to all students? Because uh -huh. that's another thing, another big thing that um, was really pushed forward on a, on a campus like Georgetown that is, that is residential is that once everybody left, you know, the inequities between our between the students was just amplified to such a degree that you couldn't just you couldn't ignore it anymore. Right. You couldn't just know it intellectually, but not worry about it because, well, everybody's here on campus. so Everybody's fine. Right. It was it was literally in your face over Zoom or mm -hmm. Cisco or whatever it was you were using. So, again, these are all these are all realities um that 
we're we have to grapple with for our for our design as we, we rethink it as as I think we should. Will we? I don't know. But I really think that this is a, this is an opportunity to to do that. And so, to your question, is is that um, that's not my area? I have student services people. I would say Joe Fisher, who's our student life um, person at Georgetown, has uh, they've done a great job there, and I'm sure the student life people on your campus have too. But there's it, it's a lot of intense work. It's a lot more when you can't drop in, you have to be much more proactive in reaching out to students. Um, you know, we, we know, we know through the research that, um, that in order for, st that students are more likely to be successful in graduating is if they make a connection with someone on campus. What happens when there's no campus, right? And so how do we actively make sure that our students still feel connected to someone? It's not something, it is someone. So how do we ensure that our students feel connected with someone? That, okay, first, Chris, that's a fantastic question. I'm going to bring yeah. you up on stage in a minute. And Lee, I, I really admire the, the depth and breadth of your of your answer. Uh, I think there's a lot to be said on this. And in chat, we had a couple of comments I, I want to make sure we saw. Uh, Deborah mm -hmm. Penner uh, writes, during COVID semester away, um, high relations means some cell phone text or Zoom conferences one-on-one -on -one with students, uh, which, is, uh, which is very important. David Scobie uh, points out that uh, we shouldn't conflate high touch with elite. Uh, he recommends mm -hmm. that there are other programs that are able to do this, including the CUNY uh, ASAP program, uh, which is an effort to design high touch support and learning for low income parenting students, which doubles, doubles graduation rates, which is truly, truly amazing. Yeah, it's uh, awesome. Let's, let's, let's poke into this a bit further. Let me bring uh, Chris Mackey on stage, I think for the first time, uh, which is a real pleasure. <laughs> Welcome, Glad Chris. I could bring you out here. I'm, I'm trying to figure out which camera I'm looking at. Sorry about that. Well, now you're, you're, just, looking at us. you're just looking at us. Um, you know, my experience of the of the pandemic was really deeply, deeply um, shaped by working with some very non-traditional at-risk communities, both domestically and internationally. And, and the, the prompt for my question, Lee, thank you so much. I thought that was a really thoughtful response. I want to press a little bit in that what, what we found, especially with at-risk students, and I think we're seeing this in the, in the empirical data that are coming out in terms of learning gap and things like that. Right. Right. It's very hard to explain learning gap just on differences in mastery of technology or just on differences in engaging with student services. Some of it is almost certainly the fact that they're, they're embedded in very different learning environments in their respective homes, right? Yeah. Socially, structurally, um, we, we've done a, we, one project I was working with was um, families of migrant workers in Central California. Okay, you've got um, family traditions where if you're at home, you're childcare, right? I mean, all those mm -hmm. kinds of things. And, and it occurs to me that there's a tremendous learning opportunity here for us to really dig a little deeply into because we're stuck with the fact that we've been using classroom models for more than a century. Yeah. And everything we think we understand about learning, we actually only understand about learning in a classroom context. Yep. The pandemic created this massive natural experiment that I don't think was really adequately seized upon to investigate what happens when all the parameters surrounding a learning experience have been have been transformed. And I and I wonder, I mean, you, you say it's not your area of expertise, but you folks are more deeply networked into American higher ed than I am these days. Um, I'm wondering if you know of anybody who's really taken that on as a as a as a direct challenge. It's almost a it's almost an anthropological question in a way, right? It's, yes. It's almost a, yes. You're going to have to do some soaking and poking. Lee, go ahead. I'm sure I do. I just can't think of any right now. <laughs> like I and and again, I don't. And I see that like not to mistake high touch with elite, and I've. You know, I've I've worked at non-elite institutions. I have lots of colleagues and friends who are still there who are doing online and hybrid high touch, who are, you know, um, doing these things. And I'm just from the mentality of certain institutions and certain faculty even that these two things are incongruent. And there are people who are working um, to sort of to to try and uh, figure these things out um, in online. Um, I just. 
I'd have to dig in and f- try and find them, but I'm sure in my network I have them. Yeah. <laughs> I just, uh, I, 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 I just, I, I guess the, the the point I want to sort of register is that I think if we if we get too comfortable with the idea that this is something we can simply push out from our end and everybody mm-hmm. on the other end will thrive. Yeah. We're, we're, I, I, I worked with one uh, medical school, actually, that did everything by the book, best practices, remote learning, and still saw meaningful learning differences with certain at-risk students. Despite the fact, I mean, they were doing things that probably less than 3% of American institutions actually were doing in terms of supporting students. And they yeah. were still seeing those gaps. There's, and, and not trivial. I mean, they 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 tripled attrition rates in, in, in a couple of cases, right? So I think I, I don't know. I think I think that we get, especially in the in the remote learning community and the online learning community, we mostly came to this as tech nerds, right? And so we tend to want to use the I have a hammer, this looks like a nail approach. But maybe this really isn't fundamentally a technology problem. Right? Maybe this yeah. is fundamentally a human problem. Well, I actually wrote about this um, exact thing, and it's coming out soon-ish, I think. It might already be out. Apparently, I don't know when my own stuff comes out anymore. Um, so I, I wrote about, as, as a thought exercise, to dr- address exactly this. So in digital humanities, um, there's this concept that has come out called minimal computing. Right. And in digital humanities, it's usually like the bigger, the better. Let's throw tech at it. Right. Like you said, if, if, if it's a you know, you got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Right. So you got the database people who all they want to do is build databases. You have the TI people and all they want to do is encode an ATI. You have, you know, and I love them and they're my friends and their colleagues and they're brilliant people. But a lot of the times the digital humanities projects that are built are impossible to maintain, um, really expensive and inaccessible to most of the world because they take up so much computing power. So people elsewhere cannot even, not even help hope to replicate them. They can't even access them because they're on cell phones. So, so I they, they- prevent that as Brian will tell you, I funded a few of those programs once upon a time. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and yeah, and that's, you know, um, and, and there's some good advances that are made and there's importance to those sorts of things, particularly when it comes to preservation, but, there's this whole movement now that has come out and it's called minimal computing. And so what they're saying is they're trying to say, let's get rid of the databases. Let's do flat HTML. Let's make things low broadband. Let's distribute things on, on, on thumb drives. Let's make things accessible and create tools that anyone can use. Anyone can maintain and can be hosted on GitHub for free. I, I love the idea, but I fear that what we're really talking about is a better hammer. Right. And I'm, I'm actually wanting to redirect the conversation a little bit, too, because there's no hammer that's going to change the cultural practices of a Mixteco family. Yeah. Okay. But that's but that's the thing that that, that minimal computing also asks is it, it is it looks at the tools and says maybe that maybe the tools aren't really what we need. Right. And so it, it really does start from the question about what is the minimum that we need for this? And so I did a thought experiment where I said, well, what would a minimal a, a minimal computing approach take um, look like if we took that to remote or online instruction? Because we've been doing remote instruction, you know, correspondence courses. Um, you know, I went to the University of Alberta and, and worked as a research assistant at Athabasca when they were still mailing, you know, when it was still done by mail, largely, right? So we have this. And so my question was, you know, the, with exactly this, and we saw examples of it happening on, and you know, on um, Indian reservations in less populated areas where teachers found ways, less in higher education, more in K-12, but teachers found ways to, to educate the students given the access that they had. Right. And to try and support them. And so that was the thought experiment. It was like and, and you know, there's another one where there is an example. And this was, again, in the disability studies world where they ran an incor- entire course over a listserv. Right. And then they said it was the most connected and most intimate and most, you know, affective experience they'd ever had um, in, in a, just all on a listserv, which we all hate now. Right. But they did it all on a listserv. 
And so again, it, it's sort of thinking through what is the, what are the technologies that they do or do not have? What are the values of the audience that I'm trying to reach? How do I use those values? Again, this idea, particularly in digital humanities, um, and this also springs from it, where there's been this tension between indigenous populations and indigenous knowledge and the sort of um, impetus that we have in higher education to then go and colonize it and say, we know best how to preserve your heritage. We know best how to share your knowledge. We know best how to do these things. And so we're, 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 we're from higher education and we're here to help. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Listen, so, I, I thank you for this. I, I want to stop only because I've taken up way more than I should at the time. Oh, this. Been great. I, I really appreciate the, the, the thoughtful response. I'll look forward to reading the thought piece. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, we have uh, a whole bunch of questions, and we're actually coming up really close to the end of the hour. I know. I want to make sure as many people get a chance to ask as possible. Uh, this is one from our good friend, Mark Corbett Wilson, uh, who had a, a, a question and an answer, I think. <laughs> Hello, Mark. Hi, Brian. Good Hi, to see Andrew. you. So uh, lately I've been thinking, are all schools residential schools is it really the purpose of the institution to impose a culture onto the students but that's not why i uh, that's not the question i came to ask so i've been working uh, i'm a distance student as you know i'm way out here on the west coast far away from all the elite institutions so um it's got some out there come on <laughs> yeah whatever, whatever. Uh, i can't afford them so um, but I've been thinking about, so I'd like your response to um, how would you uh, theorize or build uh, the personal learning uh, environment or organization for um, more self-directed learners outside, but perhaps affiliated to an elite institution um, so that they can build their network, uh, uh, you know, using the internet and uh, as you say, these uh, low computing technologies, that's definitely the direction things should go. Um, and not focus on assessment or credentialing, but uh, on learning, you know, sort of an anarcho-syndicalist approach. I mean, I think that that's a really hard question to get, to, to, to kind of get in, in an answer. And we've seen experience uh, experiments with that, like there's the, P2P University was a, was an attempt to do that and keeps and keeps being an attempt to do that. Um, you know, it, it's MOOCs tried to do that, you know, to various ways. I, I, and I mean, my, my answer is going to be if we want to go totally low tech, we need to reinvest in libraries, public libraries. Right. I think that that's where community used to be formed, where you could find people like minded people. And if you have a network of libraries, right, what if the library became a node in a larger network? The librarians are networked. We have interlibrary loans. We know what's going on. Why can't that be um, a, a system that we leverage for exactly this purpose? Right. Where it's not credentialing, that it's just people getting out, they're getting together and nerding out about things. That the librarians have that expertise, some of them do, um, and and the kinds of resources. Maybe they don't right now, but it wouldn't it be great if they did once again have those resources to be able to support, better support and connect their communities with the larger world. So I would say, I would say libraries. Wrong. My librarians will love me. I say libraries. <laughs> yeah, maybe we focused on the wrong part of Carnegie's legacy. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Yes. Yes, and so much and, of those libraries. Um, I would like to give a plug to Stephen Downs, uh, is currently running one of his MOOCs. That's um, right. His new experiment is um, he doesn't even know who's taking it unless they want to reach out. Huh. Uh, and it's huh. all run on uh, you know public platforms, um, ethics, AI and analytics, and the duty of care. And it's going to run again in the spring. So people that are interested should reach out. Uh, not only is it totally free, but as I said, you don't even have to tell anybody you're taking it. <laughs> you could just uh, participate. And then he's, you know, distributing it. Twitter, he's aggregating blogs, all, you know, all the standard classic. Stuff. 
Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Great plug, Mark. Thanks. Yeah, come join us. I'm yeah. looking forward to the second version. The first version, you know, a little rough. But the second version is going to be outstanding. That's Stephen, already ahead. Yeah. Thanks, <laughs> Take care. Uh, we had a couple of quick uh, um, uh, responses to that in the uh, in the chat. Uh, Roxanne Riskin celebrated libraries. Christopher Adamson linked them to Ivan Illich. Um, uh, David Scoby points to the awesome College Unbound, using libraries as spaces for cohort-based adult college learning. Uh, and uh, Roxanne points out uh, the uh, social some of the uh, digital divide issues. And Mark DeFusco adds that Tutor.com started in the library. Um, we are almost out of time and i want to come back to a question that came up a much earlier which is a very perhaps forward-looking question uh which is what do you think about um the metaverse and nfts the whole web 3 idea um is that something where uh is that going to be part of the new education as rich uh, schultz wants us to consider so if my son is any indication, the kids think NFTs are stupid. Yeah. Um, they're like, yeah, they just laugh at people who are doing the NFTs because they then just sit around and screenshot them and then share them on social, their whatever social media platforms. They think NFTs are dumb. Um, most kids aren't on Facebook, right? Like it's, it's, whether you call it metaverse or not, most kids aren't on Facebook. And until, and, and again, you know, that, that maybe this means that it will actually happen, but until something like virtual reality takes serious consideration about disability, um, I don't think it'll take off, right? Because there are enough people for whom virtual reality like if you wear glasses, you can't do virtual reality. If you have vertigo, like I get super dizzy doing, I can't do virtual reality. It makes me sick. Um, and so while it may empower some people, other people, it just, again, it excludes. Um, you know, it's every every time we try, like uh, there was a um, an article that I, you know, tweeted or shared on Facebook about from um, hyperaller hyperallergic. Uh -huh. It's an art, it's an art journal. And it did a study of NFTs. And it said his conclusion was, huh, NFTs have just advantaged the same artists that it always is, that the, that the, that the, the, the network or you know the, the market, there we go, market is always advantaged, right? The rich just got richer, you know? And I was like, shocking, shocking. A tech dude bro disruption agent ended up just reinforcing and magnifying the status quo color me shocked you know so that's a, thank you so that's a that's a very very powerful uh, uh critique and response um you get some people chiming in roxanne points out the uh, people who are hearing impaired or deaf yep. uh, lisa durf asks us to remind to remember the distinction between meta as the company and the metaverse um uh, Rich uh, Schultz says that his college students think NFTs are ridiculous. And uh, John Hollenbeck adds, Metaverse, where we can look pretty while we learn. Um, and uh, Mark uh, DeFusco chimes in for your son. Uh, hooray for your son. Yeah, he's, I had a 15-minute tirade in a car ride the other day to swim team about how dumb MFT, NFT, unprompted, unprompted. Like, uh, he just like, Mom, do you know what NFTs are? And I'm like, unfortunately, yes. And he would like just launched on a tirade uh, and it was it was really entertaining actually <laughs> uh, uh, noah uh, geisel noah please i hope i didn't mangle your name too badly uh asks us to take a look at one educational implementation called invisible college which Ooh. is uh from its front page quote a learning dao or dao for web3 curious builders and creators um which has links to twitter and to discord um so thank you, Noah. That's a great pointer. And thank you for, uh, for bringing the question. Um, friends, uh, this has been an incredibly rich uh, conversation. And there's way too much coming up in the chats and in the, in the questions uh, that we don't have enough time for. Uh, if anyone would mind if I post this to, uh, to my blog, please let me know in the chat. Um, and if you think it's a good idea, please let me know in the chat. Uh, Lisa, um, thank you for that. I hope you have a good meeting. Lee, how how can people keep up with your terrific brain? Um, is, is Twitter best or which blog? Should Twitter is. So Twitter is best. I'm ready writing. I'm best known as ready writing on Twitter. 
Um, that's where I will typically share anything and everything that I write. I don't know, know how much impact if people read uh, on it anymore, but I definitely share everything there. Um, if you want cute pictures of my napping dog, I'm also ready writing on Instagram. Those are kind of soothing. He's very chill, old man dog. Um, and uh, my blog is readywriting.org. I try to make sure I update it with various writings and, and those kinds of things um, when they come out. Um, but Twitter is usually the best place. I'm, I'm still pretty active on Twitter, uh, despite everybody saying that Twitter is dead. It's still, until you give me one place, I can't do, my daughter might be able to do 27 Discord servers, but until you tell me one place just like Twitter that yeah. I can go to and meet and still hear from all the people that I know and love, um, cause I'm not doing 27 Discord servers to try and get everybody. So Twitter is still for me where it's at. And uh, Roxanne Riskin shared uh, uh, shared your handle in. Uh, oh yes, thank you. Thank you, Roxanne. There you go, Steve. Um, so let me let you go back to your work and keeping an eye on the hardworking dog. Thank you, Lee, so much. Um, it's been a, a privilege to host you, and it's also a privilege to be your colleague at Georgetown. Same. Thank you. Thank and you. thanks, everyone. Sorry for keeping you a little long. No apologies needed or accepted. This is terrific. Uh, friends, but don't go. Uh, let me just point out where we're headed the next few weeks. Uh, so just to remind you that some of the topics that we have coming up, uh, eco-media literacy, the climate crisis, student debt, libraries and careers, minority students on campus. And by the way, next week, we will not have a forum because of the holiday. It's just going to be impossible to get guests and all of you in the same place uh, and not totally overwhelmed by eggnog. Um, so next week is a uh, time off, but then we'll come right back roaring at top speed. Now, if you'd like to keep talking about this, everything from Web3 for education to what does it mean to rethink the classroom uh, in high flex hybrid or whatever we're going to call it, just use the hashtag FTTE on Twitter. Uh, you can find me at Brian Alexander or Shindig Events at Shindig Events. Uh, on my blog, brianalexander.org, I'm going to post the recording of this session along with the chat. Um, and if you'd like to go into the past and take a look at our previous sessions on class design, on the pandemic, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. You can find a great deal there. Uh, if you now all of this is in a hurry, I have to say this has been a delightful conversation. As usual, it shows the brilliance of the questions and thoughts that the community brings to bear. Uh, it's absolutely delightful thinking together with you. I hope you all have a very safe productive yet also restful end of this year. Please take care and be safe. We'll see you next time online. Bye-bye.